pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the official start of JuliaCon 2018. Um, I'm here because I'm serving as the uh, executive chair of the committee that organized this. Now, as all of you hopefully know, executive chair is Latin for someone who sits around, says supportive things occasionally while other people do all the real work. Um, and that's uh, n you know, n n no different in this situation than in any other one. We've had a uh, spectacular team of people, really from the inception of this of this conference, where it really started, you know, a year ago at the tail end of the last JuliaCon, uh, selecting a venue early on. We had weekly, uh, roughly hour-long meetings to make sure that all the tasks that need to be done, uh, you know, get done for a conference like this. And there are many, many tasks. This is. By far the uh, you know largest JuliaCon yet. We actually had to cut off uh, sales of tickets at uh, at around 330 people or so, and we would have been able to accommodate more if the venue had been had been uh, uh, available. So I think it's a real testament to the success of Julia, uh, a fantastic location, and the great support that that, that, that we're receiving uh, on the ground here. Um, and I think it uh, it really uh, uh, bodes well for the for the future of the language and and for future conferences. I did want to uh, uh, very much take a moment to acknowledge the people who did the work. This is actually only a partial list. Why is it? Here it is. Uh, only a partial list. Um, so we had several positions, uh, obviously everywhere from reviewing the applications to uh, 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 raising the finances to diversity and outreach to uh, Yeoman's work on the website and all of the infrastructure uh, that that uh, run uh, that takes to run a conference like this, and of course a great deal of effort on the ground, making sure that all the facilities were all set up. Um, so uh, I really want I want to uh, ask you to all give a round of applause to the people here who did so much to make this happen. I'll also mention that you know we're uh, going to be starting soon on the preparations for next year's JulieCon, and anybody who wants to be involved, it's as as in all things Julie, it's a fantastic community of people to be engaged with. Uh, I think we all had a lot of fun working on this, uh, and 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 uh, I encourage you to step forward and volunteer your services if you're interested in that. I also want to thank all of the people who submitted proposals to uh, to speak uh, or, or present posters here at JulieCon, and I want to thank all of our keynote speakers uh, for for accepting our our invitation to come and tell us about their work. With that, I'd, I'd like to actually turn to our very first keynote speaker, Tim Thornham. Um, he is the uh, uh, Director of Financial Modeling at Aviva, um, and he's, uh, they, they've been using it, uh, it to um, uh, uh, do a lot of forecasting uh, of risk, and so he's going to tell you all about that. And uh, one, I guess one last note of thanks, which is it also takes quite a lot of money to put a, a, a conference together like this, and we're grateful to all of our corporate sponsors. Um, so anyway, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Tim Thornham. Is the list just turn on? I had to hold my power button. Okay, good, good, right. Okay, um, well, quite a big audience. I'm very impressed, and I, I can't quite believe um, the Julia guys are trying to launch 1.0 at the same time as running Julia Conference, so I'm super impressed by that. Um, so good, good luck to the, uh, to the team who are trying to get that out today. Um, <laughs> so, the title of my talk, uh, thank you, Tim, for the introduction. The um, title of my talk is Using Julia in a Multi-User Production Capital Modeling Environment. Um, I think it might be a little bit different to some of the talks. Uh, there's a lot of talks about specific packages and specific uses. Um, what we've been doing at Aviva is actually using Julia for some of our core capital modeling systems in real production work. Um, It'll just, okay. There we go, right, excellent. Um, so yeah, multi-user production capital modeling environment. So risk, risk and forecasting of capital, um, VAR modeling, value at risk modeling, um, that sort of thing. And um, so I'm not going to be too 
uh, geeky with the technical detail, but I have got one or two little e extracts. It will be quite basic for most of you, I think, um, but it'll show you the level of my knowledge, which is, which is quite basic. But I've been running a, a fairly big team at Aviva uh, who look after the financial modeling, and I'm very lucky I've got some good people in my team who can do this stuff. Um, but when I first came across Julia, I was, I was just, I just thought there's something here. You know, for many years, I've been struggling with the idea that you know, you can't really do stuff in R or C++. It's just too difficult. Maybe Python. We'll have a go at Python. Um, but when, Julia, when I saw Julia, I thought, finally, here's something that, you, that is elegant. The thing that I really li liked about it was its elegance as well as the speed. So I think, I think one of the strap lines uses is simpli simplicity with speed. And those, I think, are the two things that I really grasped right, right at the beginning. Um, and I say right at the beginning, it's not really right at the beginning, it would be the early 2015. Um, so let me just take you on, on a little journey um, of, of how we started. And so I did a presentation back in around about March, April last year. So we're now six months, uh, 18 months on from then. So I'm going to repeat. So if any of you have seen it on YouTube, the guys videoed it and put it on YouTube. So there might be a little bit of a repeat there for the first 10 or so slides. But if you haven't seen it, that's great. You'll see it for the first time. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing over the last 18 months. OK, so we'll start with some, some background on Aviva. Um, I'll talk about how we did our first implementation of, of Julia in 2015 and 16, and then where we've gone since then. Um, and as I say, we're not really playing with the system. We're actually putting it into production use. Uh, so there'll be quite an element of how, how is this used in a production sort of uh, environment to do re real numbers across multiple countries, multiple users, um, to actually sort of put our regulatory returns out, to make de business decisions on. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our second major product that's used in Julia, that we're now, now using, uh, went live in Q1 this year. So um, hopefully most of you have heard of Aviva. Um, we're the second, one of the largest UK insurance companies, the second, I think, after Prudential in the UK. Um, we have operations in the UK, uh, Canada, uh, various places in Europe, some in Asia, we've got over 300 billion assets under management. Um, it's both life and general insurance, or people from the US PNC business, property and casualty business. And um, for a number of years, uh, we've had a regulatory regime um, to, uh, to, to set our capital requirements, which is above the basic requirements we need to pay out our policyholder uh, claims as they become due. But there's an extra buffer that you need. And that was Solvency 1. Solvency 2 was, if you like, the, the upgrade to that to make it more risk sensitive and more modern in its, in its approach to, to measuring and managing risk. So that was a European-wide framework, and that came live on 1st of Jan 2016. And it was yeah, 2009, I think, was the first standard that was published before it actually you know, took seven years to get live, and it started even before 2009. So. We had to put in place, all, all major insurers in Europe had to put, with, with US subsidiaries and, uh, and other subsidiaries around the world, had to put in place these new calculations for risk sensitive measurement of, of their liabilities. Um, and that's the process, you know, we've been going through to Viva for many years and, and we got there on 1st of Jan 2016 and I'll explain how we're using Julia in that in a few minutes. And we were given, you can either do this risk sensitive calculation through a standard model, or you can do it through your own internal model. An internal model, you've got to hit a higher bar, um, and it's got to be approved, and we've done that. We've, we've gone through that process at Viva. Um, now, when we, did through, when we went through this, you know, this is back in 2009, 2010, when this started. Um, cloud computing wasn't really a thing. Um, and enterprise systems, you know, desktop systems were, were, were normal. Um, enterprise systems were quite rare, and vendors providing into this space were even rarer. And so, you know, at the time, in 2009, 2010, Aviva chose to go with probably the only product that was out there, the Algorithmics platform, which was then bought by IBM. So we licensed that in 2010. And that, that system, as I say, is one of the, it was the only sort of big credible provider out in the market was implemented at, at a number of the multinationals. So you've got Prudential in the UK, Legal and General, Allianz, the largest, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, Axe, Zurich, Generali. 
they all bought this system. Um, and, you know, we, we implemented that. It was quite expensive, quite a, quite a big effort to get it in. Um, right at the core of our internal model, in that, in that calculation kernel, you can see that ringed at the top there. And, in fact, we actually did a second generation of that in Algo. Um, and in 2013, we delivered that. Um, much faster, instead of running 100,000 scenarios, we could do 500,000 scenarios. We could get more granular outputs. It was self-service instead of run by a central team. And we got an award for that. So we, we, we weren't particularly unhappy, but, it, but we, was, we were struggling a bit because it was, it was quite a monolithic system, quite difficult to engineer. and required some very specialist expertise. Um, so, by the time we got to 2015, we were thinking there's got to be a better way of doing this. It's got to be a cheaper, more flexible, easier to manage system. And so you can sort of see where we got to. We got, we got to release two um, in 2015, 2016. And we've gone through various evolutions. We had a MATLAB version way back 2008 to 12, um, which was desktop based. Um, but we envisioned a new solution, that, which we called IM3, the third generation of our internal model. Um, that would pick up some best of breed components and we'd build it ourselves. And we wanted to be super fast, we wanted to continue to have self-service, so it was an enterprise system used by users all around the world. Um, but we also wanted to integrate it with some of the other systems that we need, so we have some standard formulas, some partial internal models, uh, and um, some reporting templates that need. And we wanted super fast numbers. Um, and we also wanted to move it to the cloud. So we just got uh, to a position where we had a specialist data center for the, for the IBM system. Um, it, was, it, had, it consumed 200 very large servers, um, some, some massive servers at the time. So it was very expensive to manage at the data center level. Um, so, uh, so, so how were we going to build this sort of best of breed solution? Um, so we, we looked around and the vendors had started to produce new systems, there were one or two that were promising, but nothing that would you could actually code yourself. It was sort of black box systems. Um, and, and then I came across Julia. Uh, this was, as I say, early 2015. Um, and I started taking a chunk of the calculations out of our model, just in Excel. We replicated them in Excel. And it, it's a massive for loop, basically. For loop in within for loops of calculations to add things up and allocate things into arrays. Um, and then disaggregate them and, 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 uh, and rank them. A, a big sort of VAR calculation. Um, and we could do that for one or two scenarios in Excel, but not 100,000. Excel would just conk out, you know, take a minute for each scenario sort of thing. Um, so, that, right, let's put this in Julia, have a go at it. So, install Julia, had a go. Um, I got 100,000 scenarios going through in 30 minutes. And I, and I was delighted because that was roughly how long the 200 servers in our data center could get the calculation done. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I could get it done on a desktop, um, one desktop, not 200. And so that, that, that was amazing. I, I, I reported back to the team, this looks really interesting. Um, and then I started playing with the code and I, and I, and I pushed some of the lookups up, up the, the loops. And um, then, I, then I started reading the literature It said you should look at this, um, I can't remember what it's called now. The, um, it's so long since I've done it. But you can, you can look at the, the memory that's used. And there was some, something going wrong with the memory that's being used. So um, I learned about type stability quite quickly. And, 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 um, and very every, every time I learned something, I moved something around, suddenly the, 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 the runtime was coming down. So 30 minutes and 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, I think we got it to a minute. And then we got a bit stuck at about a minute. Um, and we're going through this sort of um, power, uh, power of integers. Uh, we managed to inline that, and eventually, with that final change, we got it to 12 seconds. So I was just blown away by this, that something that would take 30 minutes across multiple servers um, was taking 12 seconds on a single desktop. Um, we had a look at R, and obviously the runtimes were, were substantially longer. Um, so not only was it very, very fast, and as a complete beginner, it had taken me like three weekends to get this working. Um, you know, and it was the core of our calculator, and it replicated the numbers um, on our group calculation. So 
I, we were pretty blown away. There's got to be something inside. Uh, so I started talking to some of the senior people in the, in the group and said, are you, are you happy if we start looking at this seriously? Um, and they said, yeah, have a crack at it. Um, we spent uh, X million pounds on the existing system, but if this is a real goer, you know, you should, you should explore it. So, so we did. Um, and we started to look at all the calculations, not just those 200 lines of code. And in fact, it only took us, the first version of a whole system, only took us something like 1,000 lines of code. So it wasn't actually that, that complicated. Um, and it's probably about 3,000, 4,000 now with all the bells and whistles we've put in. But we repeated all the different bits of the calculation, and, and I, got, I got one or two in my team to do that, because it's no, not, not my thing these days. But, um, and you can see some of the relative run times here, and you can see the multiples, the, the tens and hundreds. Um, and those multiples are against Algo that was a multiple server environment versus Julia that was uh, a, single a single desktop or a single server at, at work at this time. Um, so we're getting massive speed up. Um, and the code was really simple, and it only took a matter of a few weeks to get this all, all running and replicating the numbers. Um, so, you know, we, we then sort of put the project together and went into sort of full, full implementation mode. And of course, it's not just the calculations, it's everything that goes around it if we want to build an enterprise environment. Um, so, so we did all of that, and um, in about six months, we had, we had the system up and running to sort of uh, a go-live standard. Um, properly tested, regression test, all the different use cases. Um, were there any challenges along the way? Um, well, yeah, a couple of them I've just pulled out here. Um, first one was, was some of the distributions we were using were quite, were quite complicated. They, they didn't have quantile, you know, simple quantile um, estimations. Um, so we, we, we found that hyperbolic distributions used for some of our equity distributions at the tail. Um, and we, we found a new method for doing that, single pass through, all the different, doing tiny little steps, trapezium rule addition of a, prob of a, a probability to the density function, gives you a CDF of one, and if you go through tiny little steps, you can pick off the quantiles as you go, um, and you can just store them. So one pass through a whole PDF will add up to be one, um, as it must, and therefore you know where all the quantile points are on the distribution. You store those and just look them up. And that's extremely fast compared to individually trying to calculate a quantile, because essentially you have to do more or less that whole calculation for every single quantile. So we get all the quantiles through one pass instead of individually. And it was interesting, the, um, the equivalent R code to do that um, has got all sorts of very clever analytic um, calculations for different parts of the distribution and there were some bugs in the code for some parts of the distribution. Um, so we did, a ver we did this brute force simplistic approach and we spotted a few bugs in R. Um, not many, uh, but um, so that was one little challenge we had. Um, another was, and it's interesting, I don't know if Nick Hyam is here in the audience. I know he's speaking, um, but we, and I didn't know this, I know he was here obviously this a few years ago now, but we were looking at this idea, w when, we, when we calculate the correlated random variables of, of the different risks, we have a big correlation matrix, and, and the correlation matrix has to be um, positive definite, and uh, there's, a, there's a process for, for, for making it positive definite. And, um, and, and Nick Hyam actually sort of developed an alternating projection method, um, and that's the method we actually chose to use, so I referenced that there. And that gave us a, a better approach than the original approach that we had in Algo. Um, so that was another little technical bit of detail that, that we worked on. It was quite, and, it, and that gave us, a, gave us a lot more flexibility about the way we used the, uh, we set the correlation matrix as well. Um, so we got live. Um, having looked at this at the beginning of 2015, uh, we eventually went live for half year 16. And we went production-wide across the group. So remember, Solvency 2 only went live at the beginning of 2016. So the Algo system, even though we'd had it for seven years, it only lasted six months of regulatory reporting, 1116 to mid-2016. And we replaced it with IM3. So I'm, I'm very pleased for the support I got uh, within Aviva to, to help us get this through. Um, but, um, uh, and we did this, I think, I think, I think we must have started talking to Viral, and, and I can't remember when we started. I think we started talking about maybe the end of 2015, and we, and we had a little session, didn't we, where we presented to, to one or two other people in the UK, um, just to, 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 to talk a little bit about our experience. Um, 
But this is, this is a grid that we use for our regular monthly service reporting. You can see um, we, we have a service availability. We want the system to be up and running. This isn't, just, this isn't really just Julia. It's all the components around it. So we try and keep, keep the uptime. Uh, run times, 20 minutes, 45 minutes. Depends what sort of run. We try and get all of our runs within that. Um, failure rates, uh, less than 2% is our target. And you can see that the just, just struggling a little bit to hit 2% failure rate. Um, and that's because people tend to put inputs into the system that don't make sense and uh, it sort of throws the system. So you've got to try and c capture all those at, at, at the input stage. Um, so that's the sort of thing we do. We, 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 we make sure that we, we talk to our users, we put enhancements in and we, and we show them how, they're, how we're performing and we, and we try to improve the system. Um, and this is a, a, a quick view of the, the usage of the system back then, uh, mid-2016 through to January 2017. And you see the big spike at year end. Um, so 31 December and on, we, we get this spike. We get a bit of a spike in September, October as well because we do some calibrations ahead of year end. Um, and you can see the distribution, UK Life, with the, 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 the purple bar there is, is uh, our biggest user. And we have the group, the group team who then do a whole consolidation of all of this and re-rank everything. Um, so about 1,400 runs a month around the world. Um, so, so that's where we were at the end of, uh, at the beginning of 2017. Um, and that's where the initial presentation finished. I, that I presented last time. So, so now moving forward, I guess, in time, this is where we are now. So we were, we're running about 1,400 at, uh, runs across the world in 2017. There's something like 2,400 now. So the usage has steadily gone up um, over time. Um, I think as people have got familiar with the system, they can use it for more things. Um, and they actually put more granular information into it as well. So it isn't just the use the number of runs it's the it's the detail within the runs that's that's increased um, and you'll be glad to see our failure rates we've now got them down below two percent um, but as people throw in more detail into the data sets uh, there are more run volumes there's a bit of queuing in the system we have tens it's only 10 servers actually in the cloud that we use um, um, and and uh, people putting more 500,000 scenario tests through we've had to sort of as the complexity of the runs goes through, um, the runtime goes up. So we're having to sort of battle and, and get the system speeded up. So the main thing we did was to parallelize the code. And I'll just take you through some real basics of what we did there. Um, just check the time. Right, OK. So code parallel. Now, this is, this is child's play to most of you, I'm sure. Um, but to us, you know, I, I had this sort of mantra with the team, just get the system running on one core fast and don't start parallelizing and creating complexity on, on day one. So that was the first uh, when we went live. That was the mantra. But by the time we got to um, six, eight, nine months on, that right, we ought to have a crack at this. So we got one of the really good coders to have a go at this. And we, we got some of um, uh, is Simon Byrne here. He's, I know he's speaking later, but we had Right, we had Avic and we had Simon and a bit of Vir Viral's time, but Simon, I think, mainly helped us with this. But this is the simple code that we put in to, 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 um, to, to parallelize. You, you add, add obviously add the process. This will be familiar to everyone here, I guess, or a lot of you. You add a number of processes you want to, to run. You parallelize your for loops. Um, and what we did was we then shared the, or we pushed, pushed the results into a shared array. This was on single, single servers, multi-threaded on single servers. Um, and, and and that's the sort of the code we, we did. Um, so quite quite simple. It only took probably two or three weeks to get this all working, but we did hit um, a couple of things. So let's just take you through uh, the first problem we hit, because um, we're a bit novice at this. Um, so the first problem we, we had was, we, uh, we'll just illustrate it here with a really simple example, because these arrays were quite big, uh, taking up about 100 meg of memory. Um, sorry, 100 gig of memory, apologies. Um, so, very simple example, if you've got a shared array, uh, let's say it's got, it, it's got a thousand in it, and you've got a couple of processes, process one and process two, that are trying to add 10 or add 20 into that array. Uh, so we should be able to add it up to get 1,030. Um, so if process one gets there first, case one, process one gets there first, and then process two gets there, you'll, you'll, you'll follow that case one process. 
um, and you'll get 1,010, and then it'll add up to 1,030. You might flip it, might be depending on which one gets there first. It might be process two gets there first, and then process one. You still add up to 1,030. But if they both hit the array at a very similar time, almost, simulta almost simultaneously, you can get this problem that they both pick up 1,000, and they both write back. Will, the one will overwrite uh, the, the first one. So you get this problem where you don't get the right answer. Um, so th this, this took a little bit of while, of while to work out. Um, we didn't realize this sort of thing could happen. Um, but, but we did obviously then have to work out how to separate our processes so they weren't writing into the same space. Um, so we did a little bit of work there to just recode the for loops. So the for loops um, and each process that was being split up was right into different parts of the shared array. So anyway, that's if you are doing parallelization, that, that was the gotcha that got us. Um, and then the, 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 the top tip that my uh, guy in, in back at base said, tell them about this one. Um, it's quite a simple one really, again, quite easy I guess for most of you. If, you've, if you're going to parallelize, let's say, in this very simple example, we've got 12 risks we want to evaluate on three, three processes, three workers, as it says here. You might split this up naively, 1 to 4, 5 to 8, 9 to 12, because the first 1 over n, one third of them will go to the first process, the next third, the next third. I think that's the way it chunks it. And if, if A runs fast, uh, B runs slow, then the third process, running all the A's, will finish quick, and the second process will finish last, and you're waiting for the last one to finish, yeah? So you'll go as fast as, as, the, as the slowest component. So a very simple resorting of those um, scenarios or, or types of calculation to split them up. You can see, in, when, you, when you just quickly re-rank and, and split them a different way, you can see on the right, if you then uh, apportion the, the loop to a different ranking process, you'll get a split of A's and B's in each of the, the three workers. So they should run roughly at the same speed and they should finish at roughly the same time. So there you go, that's, that's uh, one of my coders' uh, top tips for, for parallelization of your, of your for loops. Um, the other thing that we, we struck, another bit of a learning we had was we, obviously in a production system, you want to be able to run it and rerun the system and get the same numbers each time. So reproducibility is really important. So you've got to control the random numbers. And then, then we, but, 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 because we were pretty good at all that sort of thing, and there's, there's a lot of basic stuff, but we did come across a problem that when we did fire the, the jobs out to servers in the cloud, um, we had some large servers and some small servers, depending on if it was a business user or a group user. And um, we could get different numbers occasionally. It was about a one in 10. We'd occasionally get these different, di different numbers. Um, so again, with, with, with Julia's help, we just uh, homed in a bit, of, a bit of trial and error. We homed in on fixing the BLAS calculations, BLAS settings in the servers uh, to, to avoid that. So, uh, so again, just something to, to look out for if you, if you go into production strength and want real, real re reproducibility. OK. so. <coughs> Um, I've mentioned a few times uh, Julia Computing, Julia Inc. Um, and so we did, we did use, uh, it wasn't a huge amount of time, about 30 days of time from, from the team, so very, very um, good, good use in our, in our project, because we had about 10, 10 people in the project team, um, and injecting that with the real expertise from Julia Computing really helped us. Um, and obviously it's a, a production system for Aviva, it's very important it stays you know, stable, so we also, we also pay an annual license fee um, for development and, and, and production support. But to be honest, we, we, it's really a safety net. We don't, we've never really needed it for any production problems. Julia's never the, if there is a production problem, it's not Julia's fault, it's something else uh, that's, that's causing the trouble. Um, and, but obviously if we're developing or if we need to do an upgrade, maybe there's an occasional bit of code that needs a bit of tweaking. So again, it's helpful to have that support there if we need it, um, but and with version 1.0, maybe that upgrade will maybe get one of you in for a day to just help us uh, make sure that all works. Um, so that's sort of the way that we've productionized Julia um, and taken it forward. Um, we, we've then, we're okay for time, aren't we? Yeah. We've then um, uh, pushed forward to our next uh, implementation um, and Again, it's an algo system. It's slightly coincidental. It wasn't 
that we've got it in for the algo system particularly. It's just that it's another, uh, and, and this, this, this wasn't as problematic because uh, the algo system was actually built for this sort of credit risk calculation. So it's quite a natural thing for algo to do. So, so algo is quite a powerful tool for this. Um, what Aviva needs to do, let me just take you back a little bit if you don't know about cre credit risk modeling. Um, we um, at Aviva, so our VAR calculation, our value at risk calculation for capital, we've um, got to understand um, how the assets and the liabilities that we have uh, respond, particularly the asset side, respond to credit risk, uh, the spreads, the spreads changing, and uh, migrations and defaults um, between, you know, from AAA to AA and, and to B and, and downwards to default status potentially of some of our fixed income assets. So we have to understand that risk over a one-year horizon. Um, and it's one of the largest risks that insurance companies is have. We hold a lot of a lot of 300 billion of, of uh, a lot of that is fixed income assets, um, and so um, that that is something we have to take very seriously. And <coughs> within the Solvency II requirements, we um, we 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 look qu in quite some detail using bank style modelling um, to to really measure and manage that risk. Um, and we don't just measure the risk, as it says here. We actually do a lot of what-if analysis on that so that we can look at the impact of changes to our asset portfolio um, and help this to support decision making. It's something in Solvency 2 we call the use test. Um, so we have, a, we have a credit risk system that was built in ALGO. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, and it was a separate implementation to the one that was, we used for IM3 uh, for, for economic capital aggregation. Um, and as I say, it was a good base system for Solvency 2 Go Live. But again, like the first system that we moved over, it was still quite unwieldy. It was a big proprietary system. It had been built probably 10 years previous um, and quite inflexible to get in at the code and change. It was almost impossible. It was quite black box in a number of areas. And we wanted quite a lot more flexibility in the system and, and, and perhaps to try out new methods going forward. Um, so. You know, we were not entirely happy with it. So again, it was our second second key area that we wanted to look at if we could customise. Um, so we so we took this one on. We um, we, we sort of um, worked through the business case. This is the post business case view as opposed to the pre, but it, it looked the same. Um, we made the case internally that if we did do this, we'd have a better, faster, and cheaper system. It would be better because we'd fully understand every bit of the code. There'd be no black spot, black box elements of it. We'd build it in a way that's a consistent architecture with IM3, uh, the, the first system that we built, um, and that would allow us to have a flexible resource pool. Um, who we wouldn't need specialization in two different systems. We could use one one team across the two systems. Um, we could change the input and the run configuration to to make it more friendly, more flexible, um, and the way Algo was set up, you typically had to run one and then run another and then run another. It was very, very seriatim as it were, as it were. Whereas we could set this up to do bulk runs and sensitivities, push it out onto a grid. So it would also be faster. We thought it would be faster. As it turned out, it wasn't like the first system. So Algo as is actually engineered to do this sort of thing. So, so Algo actually stood up quite well. There's a lot of C++ in there. So w there are elements that are faster in Julia because it's built for purpose. This is Algo, which is a bit more generic, but it is C++ core code. So um, we have made it a bit faster, but it's not the same scale as the previous uh, examples. Um, and we did that by um, making it more scalable, only generating what we needed, not some generic stuff. Um, and um, yeah, we could, we could run it end to end. We didn't do stop start. There's a lot of things in the algo system that made you, you know, go one step, then another step, then another step, and we thought we'll just push push the whole lot through once you once you're confident. Um, and once you've got it running faster, um, we we got it in the cloud. We got scale. We could scale up and scale down, and that would reduce the cost as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And we didn't need the dedicated algo resource, so so our costs come came down. Uh, so that was the going in business case, but also the coming out business case. Um, it, it, it proved to be, proved to tick those boxes. Um, and we did that pretty much through last year, and in Q1 this year we went live. And 
just on the scaling, I'll just, just pause and talk a little bit about the scaling. Um, how did we do the scaling? So we knew with this calculation it was a little bit more intense than the first one. So the first, the first calculation, we had ten, 10 boxes in the cloud, and a job comes in, just one job, one server. So if there's 10 jobs, they'd go out one to each of the, uh, of the servers. If there's a few more than that, they'd go into a queue. Um, with the credit risk system, it's, it's a higher scale uh, compute complexity. So with this, we wanted to scale out um, horizontally, if you like, um, for a run and distribute across multiple servers. So to do that, we decided we'd use Spark, uh, the Spark Apache Spark technology, uh, which, is, which is quite neat. There's a, there's a package, a Julia package, um, which was still quite early days. It was quite an early version. And we, we, we teamed up with the, the, uh, the Julia team to sort of turn that into a production production level uh, uh, package, which allowed Julia to, cook, uh, to, to, to bind into Spark and allow us to, to, to fire out. And you can see from this diagram on the right how we, we've got sort of a linear process where you start, you load your data, you then go into scenario generation. So you, you do that centrally, but then you want to push that out across multiple servers and then reduce that back down into a big, a big array, which is that box that's shown there. And then you want to then push that out again to do a different process and bring it back again, and finally produce your reports. So that sort of map reduce type technique, Spark is very good at that. It pushes the data out, then allows you to bring it back. Very simple commands, quite scalable. Um, and that um, allowed the calculations to go faster, but it also allowed us to scale, you know, scale down the infrastructure, so we only pay for what we use, which again is, is quite an important consideration. Um, when you're doing this regularly on a, on a sort of production basis. So that, that seemed to go pretty well. You know, it wasn't without its, its teething problems. We had to learn some new technology, and the team are not necessarily specialists on Spark. They'd never, none of them had ever seen it before, even heard of it before we started this, but, but it seemed to go pretty well. And that's now in production. So as I say, we went into production with that system uh, in Q1. It's a bit more complex than the first one. Um, there's a more complex set of user inputs, which is sort of shown here, sort of uh, um, just, in, just in simple box format at the top. And you know what we talk about as production, we have a service types, we have a user guide, we, we have a, a SharePoint front, front end where you go in and you can get all your, all your information. So um, that's the way we sort of productionize it and then make it available to, to our users. So we've now got two systems, IM3 and CM3, both with the Julia core. Um, both running in AWS Cloud, um, and uh, you know it's, it's it's been a fantastic journey working with Julia so far, um, and uh, that's a real quick canter through where we've got to, I guess. Um, so I'm happy to. Uh, I don't know where, how much time have we got. Twenty minutes. That was a real qu real quick run through. Okay, I went a bit faster than I should have done, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. Let me just repeat the question. Yeah. Did we look at any other ways of distributing the calculations that were more Julia-based rather than Spark, being a, a different technology? Um, it, it, it's very interesting at Aviva. We're you know, it's a big corporate, and we're quite tightly governed about which technology we can use. So there are design authorities and enterprise architects and things like that. So even getting Julia, I didn't even talk, didn't talk about this. You know. It, it took quite a lot of effort to introduce Julia into our organization for a production system. It was a new, said, well, why can't you use R? R is our standard. We've just bought Revolution Analytics licenses, Microsoft Revolution Analytics. Why can't you use that? Um, we said, well, it won't run as fast, and it's not as elegant, and we've already got it working in Julia. So we, we've eventually got through the arguments for using Julia. But if, uh, I don't know which, did you have any in mind, any particular distribution uh, technology? Um, no. I mean, right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
No, we didn't. We didn't take it that far. I mean, we <laughs> the big data. I guess at the time when we started this, big data is a big thing, and there's a bit of a push to use big data type technologies. So again, one of the standards within Aviva that is you know flavour of the perhaps not now. I think we'd probably have some more flexibility going forward, but. Certainly at the time, back end of 16, early 17, they were pushing us towards using big data technology. So and Spark was one of the standards that they were, they felt comfortable that we, with, with EMR, uh, they felt comfortable that we could use. And so they put, they, we sort of got pushed a bit towards it rather than having too much choice um, because we have to follow certain, certain group standards. Um, but but as, it, as it turned out, you know, we had the Spark binding, it seemed to work okay, um, wasn't a major problem, but um, I think now that Julia is a bit more, you know, understood, I think there are some options there, but um, going forward. Um, thanks for this inspiring talk. I'm trying, I think I'm fighting through the same uh, battles at my, my company to actually push Julia forward. Uh, you briefly mentioned in the last few slides uh, the the front end. So you mentioned SharePoint and the way to access all of the resources. How does the front end of your Julia code actually implement it? Is that Julia as well, or do you have um, back well the usual front end technology? Well, yeah, this is another another bit of the battle we had. Um, interestingly, it's Excel. Um, <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> um, now, I, 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 I tentatively call it an enterprise version of Excel um, Good, yeah. because nothing gets stored in Excel. Okay, so we have an RDP, a small RDP farm, three to five servers, and you spin up um, the Excel front end, and it, pull, it pulls data off S3 using Lambda functions and a DynamoDB serverless architecture for data storage and it pops up the data in Excel as a UI, and then you can go through the screens, and you can change data and save it back down. It saves it back, Lambda functions back to S3, DynamoDB indexing for your metadata. So we've actually abstracted Excel to be a pure front end. Um, <laughs> And it works quite well as a pure front end. <laughs> so, I understand for, say, earthquakes and hurricanes, how you might be able to estimate a 1 in 200 year probability. But how do you do that for credit risk? I mean, you haven't had a modern, modern financial system for 200 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's another team at Aviva who does all that. So I just. <laughs> um, we call it a calibration, a calibration. So we, 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 yeah, one in 200 years, you just don't have the data, do you? Um, so it is a problem, it's a real problem. You can, you know, you can, you can say what's one in five years, you can say what's one in 10 years, and you start building up some history, and sort of the equ equity um, history goes back a couple of hundred years, uh, yield curves go back a bit, and there are theories that you can apply, there's empirical evidence, um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of guesswork going on. Um, so it's, it's, there's a bit of art as well as science. Um, and we, we use this technique, under Solvency 2, there's something called expert judgment, which is, if you like, the catch-all for that, for that problem. And you, you basically pull together some experts and they put their views together and try to rationalize and argue you know, different points of view and w why we've chosen their particular approach. So yeah, with lack of empirical data, it, it is difficult. Um, cheers. Um, thanks for the presentation. I have a question which might be equal parts philosophical and technical, which is, you said that you started with a runtime with like a naive implementation of maybe 30 minutes, I don't remember yeah. Yeah. exactly, and then you got it down to 10, and then you got it down to one minute, and then you got it down to 12 seconds. Um, how do you decide when to stop? It was like a tail. It, it was exactly like that. You know, I got stuck. We got stuck at 30 seconds. and finally got a breakthrough to 12. I thought, right, that's that's it. I don't think we can get any further. So, I, I'm sure there probably was further we could do. And that's that was my mantra point that I that I said at the beginning. That it's before reaching for parallelization, 
just keep working at it. Just keep working at it, working at it. I am sure there's inefficiencies in it. Then distribute it. So there is a danger that you, you start parallelizing things before you've really cracked the core, the core fundamentals of the code. So I did, I did hold my team back. They, they were all for, go, having to go with parallelization. I said, hold on a minute. Just, just, just optimize what you've got. Keep, opti keep going. Um, so yeah, it, 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 that would be my, my, one of my tips, I think, is don't, don't reach for multiple servers. My other mantra was one job, one server. So <laughs> don't distribute multiple servers either. You know, so okay, eventually multi-thread on one server. Then, then if you need to go multiple servers. So, and with Spark, we did, we did, we recognised that multi-threading single server was probably not going to get us there. So we did need a technology to distribute across multi-servers. So yeah, single server, single thread, then multi-thread, single server, then multi-server. Really work at each one before you go to the next stage, because it, it is it is more it adds significant complexity managing uh, each of those stages. So I had a question regarding training and uh, adoption. Like, did you find uh, that the engineers were eager, so, so should, how should I say, to adopt? Were the different segments of the company that had, how should I say, like people that actually would touch the code that would find it more Healing than others? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an actuary by training. I don't know if you know the insurance industry, but we have this, this discipline, the actuarial training discipline. If you're in the banks, you call them quants. The equivalent of a quant in insurance is an actuary. And actuaries specialize. They can either be good at this sort of expert judgment and reporting, or they'd be good at coding. So the guys I work with, fortunately, are, are very good at coding. They like quants. So they love coding. They love a numeric problem. They'll typically knock it up in Excel, and then they need something to, to build it in. Um, if you can get them out of Excel. Um, so, yeah, so, so I use the actua actuaries and the quants in my team to do the, the modeling, but then the infrastructure, so distributing it on Spark, putting it in the cloud, we have uh, integration engineers or infrastructure people who do that, who are separate, we've got a separate skill set. And then getting the two skill sets to work together is, is, is quite interesting, and that's... Um, <laughs> That's that's a continuous challenge, and it, but, it, but it's something I've really enjoyed doing. You know, getting off the desk. This I've been at it 20 years. You know, we've been at desktop for so many years, and getting to an enterprise system, multi-servers, multi-users across the world, you have to work with IT, and build. You know, build teams and build. Uh, we we have you know, we, we we work a lot with agile. Uh, as a technique and have a joint team with scrum masters and product owners and things like that. So a lot of those sorts of techniques help to build a joint team. But yeah, you are mixing different skills together and it's, it can be... And, and, then, and then if you're in a, a company like Aviva, you have to, have to follow certain standards. So there's certain design authorities that you have to go through um, because if everyone was let to do their own thing, you know, we'd have the right mess. So it's, it's the right thing to do, but it, it, it does slow you down in your world, but it makes it a better solution overall. Um, so you just have, just have to know how to play the, the right game and navigate your way through it. And it can be a bit painful at times, but it's worth it, worth, I think it's worth it in the long run. I have a question that probably applies to a lot of speakers. But um, how, mu how many problems did you have and how did you deal with um, changes in Julia as it was developing? Yeah, um, we, we started at 0.3. I can't, re you know, I, I struggle to remember all the different versions because once, once the team were doing it, I stepped a bit further away from the actual delivery day to day, but we didn't really have many problems. Um, we weren't using anything particularly exotic in the code. As I say, the Spark distribution, we needed the, the binder, the, the, the Spark.jl uh, data package, and that's the thing we worked quite hard with, with Julia on. Um, to make that sort of production strength, um, but but actually no 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 real problems. Uh, we're looking forward to v1.0. Um, I'm not expecting any issues. Um, it's interesting. Some uh, there's a story of somebody who said they started with 0.3 and because of the changes they ended up switching to Python. But there could be a lot behind that story that, that we didn't hear. But it's it's good to hear that this was not a problem for you. We, we thought, um, at one point we switched from uh, Windows boxes to Linux boxes and we thought, oh gosh, wonder what's going to go wrong here. And I, and I, and I, I was going to have a slide on it and the guy said, well, all we need to do is change the backslash from that way to that way. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it just worked. So 
you know, we'd sort of put aside two months of development time for this, and... Uh, <laughs> so, so we haven't really had any major... The, the BLAS thing that I mentioned, the large server, small server, that one, that one got us stuck a bit. You know, it's, it's a bit annoying, isn't it? You put a calculation on one box and put it on a different box, and they're reproducibly different uh, every time. <laughs> The same number on that one, different number on that one every time. So, so that took us a little bit of time to fix. So the, the gotchas are the one, and the, and the parallelization where we were over accidentally overwriting numbers. It's it's a tiny fraction. This this synchronization point. It, it it wasn't it wasn't like happening every time. It was happening like one in ten million, you know. But it only takes one in ten million to throw your numbers. So, yeah, race condition. Yeah, yeah. So those are the sorts of gotchas, but that's not Julia's fault. That's just, well, I suppose the Blas thing. I guess you could possibly say was a, is a Julia issue, but it's. I think anyone who's using Blas, I think, would would have that problem. So it'd probably probably affect any 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 uh, any, any C C plus or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, a bit of a tactical question. So I see that you basically said that you have like nested loops and stuff, and you went for parallelizing on the CPU cores. Have you ever thought about moving to GPU because, well, I myself do it on economic models and that's really like where you get the most returns to headaches usually in developing. Because when you do it on the yeah. GPU, it goes yeah. much, much Yeah, so faster. it's a bit like my comment, keep working at it on a single thread, then work to multi-threads, then go to multi-servers, and then if you're really struggling, go to GPUs, I suppose. So I, it'd be my least favorite of those options, but I, I just don't know anything about GPUs, so who am I to say? Um, one of the things we do have is very large memory requirements, and I don't know whether that would cause problems with, with GPU. Um, we've got AV, AVX is a bit more interesting, I think. Um, so I think AVX is something we should be uh, making natively, you know, uh, optimized within Julia. Um, again, I don't know the technical details, but I think it is something that Julia itself can 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 take care of. So as a user, you don't need to worry about it. Um, in a corporate environment, if you find a great Julia package developed by some random guy in Germany, how <laughs> easy is it to? actually use that for your products? Um, well, we, 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 we could if it was really important, but with the number of packages, we only use probably a handful of packages. We don't use a huge number, actually. Um, and as part of the licensing arrangements with Julia Computing, as long as we declare up front the packages that we've got, they're willing to support those packages. So the, the Spark.jl, for example, is now supported as part of our license agreement. So um, we'd have a little debate with Julia Computing about that particular German package and whether it, it's supportable. And they, they would have a view on it probably about how production strength it is, which, which is helpful because it would give us a view on that. Um, but yeah, if we did need, you know, we, we could bring in more packages if we thought they were useful uh, and we could get into sort of production standard and Julia would stand behind them going forward. Um, you have a uh, great experience to introduce Julia to, let's say, to an existing um, other environment. Um, what, what's your suggestion that, uh, let's say, we have a new company and we would like to introduce Julia? Um, what are the first uh, projects we should uh, introduce to convince the company that it's first doing that? Wh which sort of company are you? Taco. Taco. Telecommunications. Okay, okay. Um, I, I don't know much about telecommunications, I'm afraid, but um, I, I think you know, Julia's only one part of the jigsaw. As, as I've mentioned, we talk about Spark, we've got the cloud servers, we've got the user interface is really important. Um, um, data storage, really important. So it's one of, one of a blend of components, and you've got to find it for a production system. Um, if you're just doing um, desktop um, investigation, then Julia will do the job straight straight from the uh, f from the Julia um, interface. Um, but if you want to go to production strength, you've got to think about all the different components and the service model and who the users are and how distributed it is. And and in that space, we've we've chosen Julia just for the calculation component. 
but I dare say, as we talked, it could, it could pick up other aspects like the distribution mechanism um, and potentially the UI, I guess. I think there are one or two talks about using Julia for UI. Um, but we've not, we've not gone into that space because, again, it par partly because it, it wouldn't be a recognized standard in our organization in, the, in those areas. Um, so I think stick, stick to the calculations. That's the best place to start. Um, and, you know, something that's numerically intensive. If it's not numerically intensive, you could use Excel or you could use something else. It, it, but it has so a certain amount of numerical intensity. Um, but it, it's really, as I said, it's, it's not just about the speed, it's about the elegance, the ease of maintenance of the code as well that makes it very attractive. You, you can, it's not verbose, it's really easy to understand. New users can pick it up really easily. Um, so, um, you know, if you can find a sweet spot like that, that's, that's where I think you should go. So, okay, short question. Going back to the package question over there, did you see any willingness inside of the company, inside of Viva, to contribute to the open source community of Julia? Because that obviously that's something that we like, the open sourceness of Julia. Um, well, I think, I think on the Spark JL, we actually did sort of co-develop. Co We've got one super, super developer in the team who, who actually helped um, uh, fix the, the, the Spark.gl. Um, so far, I don't think any of my other team members are so specialized and so detailed. They're more generalist developers. Um, so, you know, once we've built the system and it's working, they don't have any particular, you know, the next job isn't to go away and build a package in an open source community. So, so my team, uh, you know, there are one or two in there. There's a couple of guys, particularly one guy who, who definitely helped with the Spark.jl. Um, but, but no, they're... Unfortunately, they do this as a job, not as a hobby. Um, so they'll turn up nine to five and a bit more longer. You know, these are, these are good guys and they're dedicated to their work. And that's what they'll do. They'll, they'll get on and do the job that's required. They won't necessarily then spend their spare time doing it. Um, some of them do, but you know, this one guy, but um, yeah. Uh, 